You're listening to episode 92, Dealing with Multiple Traumas and Persevering Through Them, with Jenny Maher. Welcome to the Grass Gets Greener podcast, the show for survivors by survivors. I'm your host, Melissa Wilson, a bullying survivor and anti-bullying advocate. And each week, you'll hear from a survivor who has overcome a traumatic experience to go on to not only survive, but thrive, so that you can too, starting now. Hey there, welcome, and thank you for tuning in to this episode. Thank you so much for being here. I really do appreciate it. And first off, I just want to apologize for not releasing this episode last Monday, as I said that there would be one last week, Uh, but unfortunately... Uh, I wasn't feeling well the week leading up to releasing this one, and I just wasn't able to get it ready in time to have it out for last Monday. So if you were looking for one last week, I apologize. But nonetheless, I have it ready for you this week. And we're going to be joined by Jenny Maher, who is a survivor of multiple forms of traumas in her life and I think that she has a really incredible story, and so I'm glad to be able to bring it to you here today. Before we get into it, I do just want to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by Audible.com. Audible is the premier provider of digital audiobooks. I signed up with them to get you a free audiobook download along with a 30-day free trial. They have over 180,000 titles, including some that have been mentioned on this show in the past, that you can choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or whatever you use as an MP3 player. So if this is something that interests you and you want to check it out, all you have to do is go to thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash audible, and you can go ahead and get your free audio download along with that 30-day free trial. So Jenny is the author of her memoir entitled Never Give Up, How Determination and God Gave Me a Better Look at Life. And like I said, Jenny has experienced multiple forms of traumas, and I'm going to you know, leave that for Jenny to tell us about everything that she's been through and not get into that too much here. But what's really incredible about Jenny's story is the determination that she has had and how she's been able to persevere and you know, get to where she is today. But Jenny's going to tell us about how she felt like she had to grow up quickly as a result of everything that she was going through, and how she had no support network, and how it was difficult for her to ask for help. And then we're going to give some advice on how to support someone who is dealing with mental illness or disability, and you know we're going to get Jenny's perspective on that because I know that you know for a lot of people it's not always clear about how to you know, go about handling a situation like that. So we're going to try to give you some some helpful advice there. And after everything that Jenny had gone through, it all kind of culminated when she was 34 years old and she became paralyzed from the neck down. And she's going to tell us about that. And she's going to tell us about how she felt like her life had been saved for a reason. And we're going to talk about taking things for granted and She's going to tell us about how she was able to persevere and take back control of her life and why it's important to push ourselves sometimes, especially if we're going to be able to persevere and take back that control. And she's going to tell us about where her strong will came from because she definitely is a very determined individual. And she's going to share with us when she first felt accepted because it took her a long time for her to reach that point in her life where she felt that way. And in spite of the paralysis, she's going to tell us about the things that she's able to do today and how she's been able to get some mobility back, which I think is really incredible. So while parts of this story are definitely very sad, you know, to hear about everything that Jenny had gone through, um, I think you'll also find it really incredible to hear about where she's at today and the perspective that she has And I think that there's a lot that can be taken away from this one for any of us. So without any further ado, we're going to go ahead and get into it. And I'm going to bring Jenny on and I'll catch you in the outro. 
Jenny, welcome to the podcast, and thank you for joining me here today to share your story with us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm happy to have you here. And so I came across you and your story through a service called RadioGuestList.com, where you were listed as a featured guest. And there was a little summary there about you that read, Jenny Maher was forced to deal with multiple life-threatening experiences, but her determination to fight after becoming physically, emotionally, and spiritually paralyzed will touch anyone's heart and encourage them to not give up. And so I looked into your story and knew that it was one that I definitely wanted to have you share here with my listeners. And you talk about how a lot of people can relate to your story in one way or another because you've been through so much and have experienced so many different types of traumas. And in your case, you experienced these things well into your adulthood. And, you know, some of us, we experience things only during our childhood and then we go into our adulthood being affected by that and having to learn ways to deal with it. But then some people like yourself experience things in childhood, but then you continue to experience things beyond that. And that leads to having, well, more things to deal with and being affected in even more ways. But in spite of that, Jenny, what's really inspiring about your story is that you persevered through all of this and never gave up. And you've written a book called Never Give Up to not only share your story, but to encourage others to not give up as well and to provide them with the hope that they need. And so I know there's a lot that we can get into with your story and I want to get into as much as we can. Uh, and so why don't we start at the beginning and, and then we'll go from there. Does that sound like a plan to you? Yes, that's fine. All right. So, yeah, let's just kind of start out with, you know, what life was like for you growing up as a child. Um, were things good at first? Like when did the first traumatic thing happen? Uh, when did that begin? Well, I, my first experience with my mom, because my mom was bipolar, and she, so she had to go in and out of hospitals because she'd have psychotic episodes. And I remember when I was seven, um, she had, I woke up and she was lying on the couch and she was just spreading out numbers and letters and everything. And my brother, who's four years older than me, was more interested in stealing the money, her money. And so he wanted me to go off to school, but I happened to have my mom's PIN number because I was the responsible one, even though I was younger. And so we went and get the ATM, but my mom didn't really know how to get back home. So we she was driving on the freeway and hitting all these buttons and signals and everything. And it was very scary because she she wasn't cognitive of what she was going on. And it ended up that I was able to direct her to her therapist and get her to a therapist. But because of her not being cognitive, she had to go in the hospital. And so that meant because we had no family in California where I live, we always went into foster care. So it was those types, it was those type of experiences that would happen and it would happen just sporadically. So we never knew when the police would show up and it was time to go in foster care because my mom would get sick. And in, and in Los Angeles, the foster care system was terrible. There was overcrowding and the foster kids were not nice to me. So it was not only being away from alone in the foster care system, but being with kids that were mean anyway. So just during my childhood, it was there was no balance that I had. So and I was kind of the one who took care of my mom and made sure that she was happy. And so, so it was it was I really wasn't able to have a real childhood. I kind of grew up pretty fast. Yeah, that must have been tough. And, you know, never knowing when you're going to be going into foster care um, and having to you know, try to take care of your mom, as you said. Um, I think I read that your dad had passed away when you were young. Yes, he died when I was three in, from a car accident. So I never, and he was, apparently um, my parents were divorced when I was like one. And I think he was on his way to do the time, to, time with us to take us for his time. And mm. so I never really knew him and I don't remember anything about him. But it affected my brother a lot because he was seven when it happened and Mm -hmm. So it, that was traumatic for him. And I think that kind of messed him up. Yeah. Did you have any type of father figure growing up? Um, Kind of. My mom had boyfriends, but they weren't really, they're more just her boyfriends. They weren't really a father. So I didn't really have any, anyone in male figure. I didn't have any male figure in my life th throughout like my, my life, my entire life. Yeah. And what was your relationship like with your brother? <laughs> 
That was not <laughs> that was not good. He yeah. he would beat me up and I mean he gave me bloody noses, he gave me black eyes, he'd beat me up and he he got into drugs and so he ended up going into foster being placed in foster care permanently when I was 12. So then it was just me and my mom. So then my mom, it was more, I, she, she took her aggression out on my brother. So when he was gone, it was taken out on me. So she, she didn't hit us or anything like that, but she'd get angry and start yelling and screaming and throw things and slam doors. So it was, it was more just like stay out of her way. And so, I mean, it wasn't like physical abuse. It was more emotional because there, she didn't know how to give any comfort. Like we were never uh, put in bed or said goodnight, you know, had any kiss goodnight or anything. There, there is no bonding, no hugging or anything like that. So I really, I mean, I basically grew up really fast. Yeah. It, you must have felt like you were very alone, too. Yes. I mean, I I tried to take time by, like, after school, I'd stay in my room and do homework. And during the summer, I worked from, from the age of 13 to 16. I worked during the summer, and I did after school sports. So I did whatever I could to utilize the time so I wouldn't be home as little as possible. But you can't do that forever, so. Yeah. Did you have any kind of support system at this time? Did you have friends that were there for you or no nobody knew about my situation because because I didn't have that connection with my mom or with really anybody I did and because I was afraid of going into foster care I didn't really know how to talk to anyone like the teachers and stuff they knew something was going on at home because I was quiet and but I couldn't it was so hard I wanted so bad to tell what was going on and just talk to somebody but it was so hard to just say the words can I talk to you and literally I'd sit with teachers like for an hour after school and I just couldn't really voice that and because I held on to that emotionally it affected me physically so from the age of seven I had migraines I had stomach problems I had ulcers I mean it affected me physically because of all that stress I was holding inside and I also became a cutter when I I accidentally cut myself and I found out that my mom gave me the attention the, the motherly attention so then I began trying to hurt myself on purpose so that I would get some kind of attention. And it became mm-hmm. more of an addiction where I realized that as I got older, that in order to get rid of the emotional trauma that I was dealing with, I, ha- I caused physical trauma. So that kind of deterred me from what I was feeling emotionally. And so it affected me in a lot different ways than people would think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds like just a, a very confusing time for you. Yeah, and it's just not having any support at all. It was yeah, made that, it really that's hard. the tough part. Yeah, mm, yeah, and that's what's important that people don't realize. I mean, even if you have people have mental illness or any kind of disability, they're so afraid to like they're going to intrude their space or they're you know they're not going to feel like talking. So you know, leave them alone. You know, let them come to you you but it's like I wish you know somebody would have you know just taken me away and just you know been there for me and people think that they're invading your space but but that's what you need you need that person whether it's friend or family to just be there and even though so many times I said no leave me alone leave me alone I'm fine I'm fine when inside I was like wishing they would just push themselves to, you know, make me talk or be there for me, even though I was telling them no, no, no. And I, I wish so much that even, I mean, my mom did ask to go to some of my after school sports events and I told her no, because I didn't want to bother her or her to, you know, invade her or, you know, take her time away. But I wish I'd look in the bleachers all the time, hoping that she'd come anyway. And that's hard. That was really hard as a teenager. I mean, teenagers deal with that now. You know, they they hide in their room. You know, they get on Facebook, they get on Internet and everything. And the parents, you know, they think, you know, they, they have their friends or they, you know, I don't want to invade their space and stuff. But, you know, the it's we've gotten so much in with internet and with all this stuff that we're not bonding with each other in a physical matter of just talking one-on-one we're doing everything through the computer and everything there's no actual physical you know having dinner together or going out and doing something as a family without technology and stuff and so it, 
I think if, if I mean, we didn't, I didn't have that growing up, but I just wish that somebody would have taken the extra effort to not care what I said and just said, no, I'm going to help you out, you know? Yeah. And I can relate to that in my situation. And I think, you know, it's, it's important to mention that because um, it, what happens is, you know, we're, we're kind of sending that message that we don't want anyone to intervene or to help or to ask us what's going on. But deep down, that that is what we really want. And so it's important for people, uh, anyone, you know, maybe who's listening, who is in a situation where there might be someone in their life who needs support, that they understand that, you know, it is important to to reach out and to try to get through to that person, even if it seems like they don't want you to, you know. Yeah. And, and a lot of parents, you know, if they have a child who's doing alcohol or drugs or cutting or sex or whatever, they think they're crying out for attention. And it's, and they, they want, they think they're like being a brat and just want extra attention. And it's like, yes, they are crying out for attention. So give them the attention, you know, don't treat it like, oh, they're just crying out for attention and they're doing their own thing. So just leave her alone and she'll be fine or whatever. It's like, yes, she's crying out for attention. So give her the attention. Yeah. And it's so painful when, you know, you want someone to be there for you and, and no one is, you know. Yeah. I mean, that's that's been the hardest throughout my whole life is because I didn't have that growing up, knowing how to talk to people or, you know, interact with people that is still uncomfortable. You know, I've gotten better just, I mean, from doing things now, but go up to people and have a relationship is uncomfortable. I mean, I've only had like two boyfriends my whole life just because I don't know the way to do it or whatever. So, I mean, that interaction is a main thing in anyone's life. Yeah. When you don't have that growing up, you know, then you just, it, it becomes, you know, something that's like foreign to you and you don't know how to have that later on, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, so, so tell us like what ended up happening, um, you know, once you got a little bit older, um, I think you ended up like leaving home and going in, was it the Air Force? No, actually, my mom kicked me out on my 18th birthday. The day of my okay. 18th birthday, she kicked me out. And um, she's never explained to me why. And she actually called one of the friends that I played sports with, her fam- their family, to see if I could live with them. And we weren't really close. I mean, we were friends just from school, but we weren't like best friends or anything. So I had to go live with them until the end of school. But it was like when school was out, where was I going to go? I, I had just some money from working, but I didn't really have any place to go. So it just happened that the recruiters were at my school during the end of the senior my senior year. And I kind of just looked into it. I had always wanted I love children. I still love children. And I wanted to be a pediatrician. I love medicine. And so I wanted to do get a job in the medical field. And so it was basically a decision between the Air Force and the Navy. And I chose the I chose the Air Force because I didn't want to wear bell bottoms. So <laughs> I ended up choosing that and I happened to get a good enough score that I was able to get a guaranteed job in the Air Force as a medical lab tech, which I loved. So that helped me to start over kind of. Mm-hmm. But then that didn't end well, right? <laughs> no, because after after all my training and I was in my regular duty station, again, I was alone. And it was because I didn't know how to, again, really make friends. I kind of did my job, did things and tried to do things outside, but I didn't really have any close friends or anything. So I started getting depressed and the depression would get worse and worse. And so it got to the point where I was feeling suicidal and I I was admitted to the uh, mental health department in the in the Air Force, and eventually I was medically discharged because of my um, diagnosed with bipolar and uh, depression and PTSD. So mm-hmm. I ended up having to get out of the military with medical discharge. Yeah, and then where did you go after that? I um they well, I was in the uh, outpatient hospital for a while, mm-hmm. but then I was able to live with a friend that I met while I was in the hospital. And so I moved to Colorado where she lived and her husband and two kids. And I did good there. It was actually pretty good. I mean, with the kids around and, you know, I was with people. So I was actually, everything was going really good. And then um, something happened. I was not treated well. 
I don't want to say everything about my book, but so sure. I, so I ended up uh, having to, I w- I was going to um, jump off a bridge because of what I because I again I was in a situation where I had nowhere to go. I had no one to turn to, and so I just felt like I had no reason to live again. Like so. I ended up going into the hospital again, and I, I went in and out of the hospital for years, 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 up until um, the time I, when I, when I was 34 and I attempted suicide for, that changed everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, so you woke up from that and you were paralyzed, right? Yeah. I was, uh, I, my mom had again disowned me and she also, she also said, sent hateful emails. So I didn't, I felt, because she was my I don't know if people would understand. It's hard for people to understand when they have people around them and stuff. But when you're fully alone, all you ha- all you do is dwell on what you don't have or who- being all alone, and it just it like a black hole. It just tr- you just go-, go into this hole and you can't get out. And when you don't have anyone there for you or anyone around to help you, it's like there's no control. And it's just like there's no, I had no reason to live. And it was even, it was even so bad that I felt that even when I died, it's like I had no friends or family close that I was like, if I died and had a funeral, there wouldn't even be anyone at my funeral because I don't even know people. And that's how bad I felt. That, that I didn't matter in the world. And so I tried it overdosing. And in actuality, it should have, the, from what I took, it was enough that it, sh- it should have killed me. There's there's no doubt about that. But uh, I ended up, my neighbor, because they seen me come and go, they, I hadn't been out of the house for days. And I found out later that they had called the police. And so it was three days later and I woke up in the uh, emergency room. And that was when I, I found out that uh, I couldn't move. I could only move my head I couldn't move my arms I couldn't move anything and they that must have been so scary yeah well I they the doctors were pretty positive thinking that because for some reason I had a lot of swelling in my spinal cord and I had some lesions and so they felt that after giving me prednisone that the swelling would go down in my spinal cord and that I would get feeling back so they you know ran a lot of tests and they felt that my feeling would come back in my limbs and stuff too so that it wouldn't be permanent and so I wasn't really worried at that point because the doctors you know weren't worried so it was it was after two weeks when they got all the test results back and the doctor didn't even know what to call it they they said they had to look on the internet and they ended up they they said it was cervical ischemia which cervical means neck and ischemia is loss of blood so there's no true no one can truly give me the answer of what caused from sitting or whatever with my head forward, what caused the blood flow in my neck to basically die. So that part of my spinal cord died Mm. and uh, they said that it was permanent. And that was when I kind of lost it. Mm. Yeah, that must have been like, I mean, I can't imagine how you felt at that point. I mean, you must have felt very depressed, right? Well, yeah, the hardest was that my mom I mean, I'm in ICU, you know, hooked up to all these things. And my mom rarely came and visited me and she she didn't really. So I'm like sitting out there, can't do anything. I can't move anything. I can't even barely change the channel on the TV. And I mean, they have the nurse's button. They have it taped to the pillow by my head because I can't move anything but my head. And so, you know, lying there without able to get anything or do anything or have anyone to talk to or, you know, that was made it even harder. And then even when I found out it was permanent, I called my mom and my mom told me that I could cry for one day and that was it. And so it was just like the only time I showed my emotions was at night and it was, you know, crying. I it couldn't cry too much because I couldn't get my nose to run and then I couldn't wipe my nose or anything. So it was it was hard. I mean, I was in the hospital for six weeks before I was taken to the, put it the VA. So Mm -hmm. it was, it was really hard. Most of it was because I was by myself and I didn't have really any support with me. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that was like rock bottom for you? Well, I think it was rock bottom 
because at first, because I, because I survived and I didn't want to, Mm -hmm. but when I survived it, it made me realize also that I shouldn't have survived. And because I survived, I felt that God saved me for a reason. And even though I have no, you know, I didn't go to church. I didn't, I didn't know anything about the Bible. And I believe there was a God. I just didn't believe in God, but it was mostly because I wasn't shown that in my life. So I believed that God saved me for a reason. I wasn't sure why, but I just knew there was something, some reason, but it didn't, you know, I still had really, I mean, for years, I had really tough times, you know, really times where I was just screaming, you know, what, why is this happening to me? And Mm -hmm it's uh, it was it's been a tough road <laughs> yeah it sounds like maybe that gave you some hope though yeah leaving that yeah that you were here for a reason yeah but yeah. it didn't i mean going through the physical therapy rehab and dealing with i mean people don't realize how much they have until you, you lose it all and i mean not being able to get out of bed and get a drink of water or you know mm-hmm. making the sure things we take for granted right and making sure you know just the call button is where i can reach it because then it's like i have to scream out into the hallway until someone walks by and gives me the call button you know just simple things that we don't even realize i mean i couldn't feed myself i couldn't i couldn't do anything for myself i had to i had to start from start totally over learning everything over again and i was at the point when i i mean i couldn't even i couldn't even sit up because I didn't have I I had no muscles anywhere so I couldn't even sit up on the edge of the bed and I mean I there is one instance when I was when the therapists were you know because I was in bed so long they're trying to sit me up because my blood pressure kept dropping so low and so they went to sit me up on the bed end of the bed and I was so scared because I just couldn't trust them that I wasn't going to like fall face first onto the floor. And my, I started getting dizzy and lightheaded. And I asked them, I want to lie down. I need to lie down. I'm not feeling well. And they're like, no, no, just sit here for a while. I'm like, no, I'm not feeling well. And I couldn't even just lie down by myself. I mean, I had to have it in their hands to lie me down. And they finally lied me down. And my blood pressure was like 40 over something. And they had to give me fluids and do all this stuff. So I didn't, after that, because they wouldn't lie me down when I asked, I didn't want to sit on the edge of the bed with them again. And it's like not having control over anything and giving other people control and then they take advantage of it or they, you know, don't think that they're doing right for you. But it's like, you know, if I want to do this, please let me do this. You know, I still have that issue now. I mean, if I can't get something and I ask the caregiver, you know, can you get this for me? And it's like, I got to wait till she's done doing stuff. You know, I can't just go over and grab something off a, a table or something. So, I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a, it's a lifetime you know, adaption, but I've learned, you know, to be patient and do, I've, you know, I've gotten strong and, but it's been a, it's been a, it's been a rough road, it's been a very rough road. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but, but you decided, you know, that, that you were going to persevere through this, right? And you were going to yeah, try to get some decision. control back, right? Yeah, I made the decision. I mean, they told me because of my level of injury, my level of injury is C5, C6, which you're not supposed to, you don't, according to the book, you're not supposed to have triceps, abdominal muscles. So you shouldn't be able to sit straight up without falling forward, which I still do, but it's not as bad. And you don't have the triceps to, you know, push yourself in a manual chair. So they were like, they were doing the therapy that get me strong with the muscles that I had. And According to the book, I was going to have to stay in a power chair and be live in the hospital because there's nobody to take care of me. And I didn't have the kind of home that was available. And so, you know, I told them I, I didn't want to be looked at as just disabled in a power chair because every time I was in a power chair, people wanted to help me. They wanted this for me, this for me. And it's like I wanted to do it myself. And even when I tried pushing myself in the manual chair. You know, I pushed myself and my arms would be killing me and people would be like, oh, let me help you. I'm like, no, 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 I need to do this for myself. And that's what a lot of people don't realize when they um, face with the disability is it gets hard and then you want other people to help you. And I found, I saw that a lot at my rehab is that a lot of the people would go into their power chair, but they could walk with a walker and they could, their arms are fine that they could push themselves in a manual chair, but it was easier to be in a power chair. And I've known people that they went backwards because they'd go in a power chair and they're no longer using the arms or anything. So 
They right. can no longer wash their face as well. They can't brush their teeth, you know, and they just degress. And with me, because I've been pushing myself in a manual chair and doing things that, I mean, my arms are hurting right now because I've been painting all day and just pushing that I now have some triceps, which they don't understand how. And yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, but th- they go by a book of what you're supposed to have, what you're supposed to be able to do. And even the therapists that were the spinal cord unit at the VA, you know, I was able to sit up in a way. And I even asked the therapist, I said, if, if you had somebody at my level of injury, would you be pushing them to do what I'm doing now? And they said no. And they wouldn't expect, and they wouldn't, they don't expect them to be able to push themselves in a manual chair. And I'm just like, you know, you need to push people to go past that. And so many people, then they go home and they want their wives or their children or their boyfriend or their girlfriend to, you know, when things get hard, instead of going over there and getting it themselves or finding a way to get it themselves, they're like, can you just go get this for me or can you just do this for me? You know, because it's easier. But in the end, it, it makes you weaker and weaker, not only physically, but mentally, because you you get more and more dependent on other people. And it, it doesn't even have to be with, you know, paralysis. I mean, it could be when you, having the flu. You know, you, you lie in bed when you're not feeling well, but then, you know, you, you end up saying, oh, can I get some soup? Can you send me this? Can you this? And every time you every day that you stay in bed, it's going to take two and a half days to get back. And mm-hmm. people don't realize that. And they just get tired or they, you know, just don't want to or they get be babies that they just want to be taken care of. And families are have a tough road than saying, no, you got to go get it yourself. You know, and a lot of people, especially parents who have disabled children or, you know, wives or husbands, you know, they, they don't want to push their child because they don't want to see them suffer. They don't want to see them hurting or something. But it's like you have to let them figure out how they're going to get something or do something. And that's what I've had to do. I mean, I had to figure out different way of eating and brushing my teeth because the VA, they wanted to give me all this kind of adaptive equipment for everything from brushing my teeth, having a special brace, having a special handle, having all these Velcro. I mean, I had a whole drawer of adaptive equipment and I was just like, I'm not going to go around and just have someone put all this adaptive equipment on me. I'm going to figure out how to do things without any adaptive equipment. So I don't use anything to, to write. I don't use to paint. I don't use any kind of adaptive equipment. I just figure out the way it's going to work for me. And it takes a while, like just writing. It took me forever to get good at writing. And but you work those muscles and it just as you as you continue, you get stronger and stronger. And then it's like you think back, it's like, man, a year ago, I could barely write my name. Now look at me. I'm like writing like crazy, you know, so it's hard and it's tough. But the rewards after is so much that it's overwhelming how much. Mm, That's so true. Where do you think that your strong will and perseverance came from? I mean, after everything that you had been through in your life. Well, I, I, I can't take all the credit because um, I, uh, like I like I said, when, when I first got paralyzed, I knew God had saved me for a reason. And I was embarrassed because at 34, I didn't know anything about the Bible and I was embarrassed to ask anyone. So I ended up, was invited to church when I was in a nursing home. And when I went to church, everyone there was so nice and inviting and just around me just were like, hi, how are you doing? So nice to have you here. And and I finally felt accepted. And I was able to go to a different VA where there was a intern for the chaplain intern. And she sat by my bed and we talked for a long time. So I finally felt comfortable. And I asked her, what are the different books of the Bible? You know, what's the different religion? You know, I didn't know anything. And so she started telling me stuff and I started reading the Bible and I read the Bible and even reading the Bible, you know, I still don't understand. I mean, even now there's things I don't understand, but I was able to, once I finally was able to move into my own apartment, which was great, I, but I couldn't have done it without so much that I was able to, I was driving. So I was able to go to Sunday school and church. And as I was in church, you're going to Sunday school, I continued to learn and I my I became more open and got to know people and talked with people. And my, I mean, I realized, I mean, there's parts in the book where 
I talk about that I was at my worst moments that I felt that I didn't go on and I like pleaded to God to help me. And there's instance where things happened that were, you know, were, you can't explain, but he was there saying, I'm right here for you. I mean, there's, and I was able to, I mean, I was hoping to get a house built for me in Tennessee and the loan didn't go through. And I was just, I felt like there, there was no hope of me being independent. And I realized now that I wasn't meant to live in Tennessee. You know, I was meant to live here in Virginia. Virginia because of the, that was God's plan. I didn't know it at the time, but I know now looking back from the things that I struggled with that God had, was there with me and he had a plan for me. I just didn't know at the time. And now, I mean, I've been, I've been going to this church now for about five years and with the same Sunday school. And I've become so close in my faith with God that I now, I mean, when I struggle, I immediately relax and think of the glass as half full instead of half empty and just pray and do what I can. And it always turns out that everything's okay. And I just have my faith and trust in God. And I just know that he's going to take care of me one way or another. You know, if it doesn't go the way I want, it's not supposed to, but it, it'll be okay. And that's what really changed who I was and how I handled things because I was finally at a place where I wasn't alone anymore. And that was big. I mean, I had an ultimate father finally, and I had brothers and sisters in Christ. And I finally had friends and people that were loved me and, you know, wanted to be around me. And I finally felt accepted. And that was heaven. <laughs> Yeah, that's great that you were able to find that and, and to have that support. I mean, for the first time in your life, probably, right? You have yes. a support system. Yes, definitely. The first time in my life. I mean, I can call people now when I get stressed. You know, I can talk to people. I can do different things. And I didn't ever have that before. And to, to finally have that is just, like I said, it's heaven. Yeah, that's great. So what does your life look like today? Like, what you know, what sorts of things have you been able to to do in spite of your disability? Well, like I said, I paint. I paint a lot now. And mm -hmm. um, the pictures I paint are things that I've prayed about and that God has led me to what I'm, I've painted. And I, I've sold some. And I mean, whatever I can to get the word out about my story. But I mostly just, I mean, I go to, I do take care of business with my my book and try to do things. You know, I hope to write another book about um, just not about my life, but just about the life of of me after I found God. So, but I'm focusing more on trying to get the word out about my book and doing as much painting. I'm hoping to open up a studio of my paintings. So that's my next goal. Mm -hmm. And you're able to drive too, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's another thing. They didn't think that someone with my level of injury would be able to drive. That's like right. when I was in Memphis, like the therapist would, whenever they got a new patient that was injured or whatever, they'd have them come talk to me. And they're like, this is Jenny. You know, she drives, she goes to school, she's, she's you know, writing, she's, you know, doing all this stuff so that they know that their life's not over because they're paralyzed. Their life's not going to end, that they're, you know, they're, they're going to still, they can still have a life. It just have to be, might have to be a little bit different than what they planned it to be. But that doesn't mean just because something traumatic happens or you live that their life is over. And that's what I didn't know and I didn't feel because I, I felt so alone. But now I know and now that's what I like to pass on is that people, you're not alone. There's there's lots of, you know, services out there and there's different things. But the main thing is, you know, people need to watch out for other people. You know, they need to, you know, if, they, if their neighbor's alone, go over there, say hi, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are alone that are struggling, and I wish, you know, I could help help them. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I think it's great that you're trying to get your message out there because uh, people need to hear it. Um, and now, how long has it been since you became paralyzed? Ten years. Mm. Ten years. And when did you start to, like, be able to do these things? Or, like, when did you start to be able to use your arms? Well, um, I was able to push myself in the manual chair after about three months after. I mean, I was able to bend my arms, but to push a manual chair, it was hard. I mean, I, I'm able to bend my arms up, but I don't, I don't have the 
triceps to push, like just pushing an elevator button. Yeah, that's the tricep. So, but it, I was able to, the hardest was pushing the manual chair, like any kind of incline. Like just a 15 degree incline, the smallest you would think that is nothing when you walk. I It took me like months to be able to get up that and then I kept doing it and then I go to a bigger incline and kept pushing it. So I, because the VA was refused to give me physical therapy, which I mean, I fought like crazy to get it. I basically had to do it on my own by going outside, finding inclines and pushing myself and doing different things like that. So I just, I'm stubborn and I'm very hard headed. So I kind of, that's what kind of helps. <laughs> yeah, that comes in handy in, in these types of situations, right? <laughs> um, well, that's great. That's great. I, I love how you just, you know, you, you continue to push yourself and, you know, not let this be something that, you know, keeps you from continuing to live your life. Um, now, are there things that you're still struggling with today uh, related to what you went with, uh, what you dealt with growing up? Well, I don't have, I'm not in contact with my mom anymore. I had to um, make the decision to get her out of my life. So mm -hmm. I still, not like before where I really missed someone, but I still wish I had family in my life because I still don't have any close family that are close to me or anything. I mean, I, I have, my caregivers are mostly my family and then the people at my church, but I still, my, mentally, I've been really stable. I haven't, you know, hurt myself and I haven't dealt with depression or anything like that. So my mental health has been stable, which is great because that was a big issue. Physically, I still deal with different pain because I push myself in a manual chair. So I deal with uh, shoulder and back pain and neck pain and stuff like that. But um, it's worth it to be able to do what I do. So, but mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm doing what I love to do. And I, I have two cats that I love and that love me. And so they, they make the day go better. So <laughs> that's great. I can't really complain. Right. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so like, what do you, what is it that you do today? Um, I know you've written your book. You said you have another one that you're working on, um, and you paint. Are other things that you have going on? No, not really. I mean, I'm just like I said. I'm just trying to reach out to marketing my book and getting that out there, which takes a lot of time because typing for me on the computer is I use a pen in my fist. And it's just one button at a time. So something mm -hmm. that people type out real fast, it takes me pretty much a day to take care of some business. So that takes a lot of my time. And because things take longer for me to do things, simple things end up taking more time. So it makes it longer day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now tell us, like, who did you write your book for? It was for anyone anyone out there that's dealing with mental or physical disabilities or not even mental physical disabilities, but who are dealing with issues where they feel alone. I just don't want, I mean, if I could help one person that saved them from trying to hurt or kill themselves, it's worth, it's worth the writing of. And uh, I just, I just want to help people. I just, because I, from what I went through and what I've experienced and what I, you know, s still struggle a little bit with, I just wouldn't want anyone else to be in that position. And in my book, I do a lot of explaining about the medical issues so that people, it's not just, you know, about my struggles and what I went through. It also familiarize people about uh, disability, the spinal cord injuries and different things that, you know, I've had medically. So it kind of informs people about, you know, getting out there and keep moving, not just limiting themselves to watching TV all day or, you know, doing nothing and so it's just getting getting out there and doing things and being around people because I, even now I, if I'm in the house too much and I'm sitting around and working and everything I'll I will start to get a little bit down and so I'll go out mm -hmm. even go out to Target or somewhere like that and just roll around and look at things and you know be around people it just up, ups my spirit so you know it's something that people don't realize that you know staying home in your house and being away from people can get anyone down not even if you have a, don't have a mental illness but just you know or just daily having to issue so I'm just trying to yeah. get the word out to help anyone yeah yeah definitely it's it's so important to be able to just get out and change the scenery and get around some people 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Where, where can people uh, get your book? I have a website. It's the mind, body, and spirit.net. And there's, it tells on there where to find it. And you can find it. It's, and it's, you can get an ebook. It's at Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, Books a Million. I mean, almost any online site that you can find it. So it's, it's, it's out there. But usually there's a lot of books that are called Never Give Up. So, uh, I tell people to put in my just my first name for the author, and it goes right to it because even I have trouble finding it when I go to Amazon because there's so many books oh, no. that are never give up. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll be sure to have a link um, on the show notes page so it'll be easy for people to find if they want to check it out. Yeah, because from the link, you can go straight to the Amazon page and find it. But it's, it's you can get it on any online site. Um, so, Jenny, I want to ask you the final question that I have for you today. And that is, given what you know now, if you could go back to when you were going through your tough times and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? Reach out. Reach out. Don't be afraid to talk to people about how what you really feel. Yeah, it's so important to do that, even if... I think even if you don't feel like it, like it's it's important to try to push yourself to do it because then usually you'll you'll feel a little better afterwards. Or you're right? afraid to. I mean, some people deal with yeah, sexual definitely. or traumatic abuse, or you know, and they're afraid to reach out because of the you know their life is going to change when they they lose that person. And but they deal with the abuse, but you know, it's it's, it's hard to to reach out in situations. Yeah, I think it comes down to just knowing who's a safe person to reach out to. Yes, yes, definitely. Listen to your gut. <laughs> mm-hmm, absolutely. Great. And is there a way that people can connect with you? Um, I know we'll have the link to your website. Well, on the website, um, it has, I, I do have my phone number. And there's also my email because uh, there's a there's actually a contest that sharing your story you can win an exercise bracelet. So it goes to my email address if anyone wants to share their story. But uh, on the website, it has different connections. All right, great. Sounds good. And so I just want to thank you for coming on here today and for sharing your story with us and, you know, for, for spreading this message of never giving up and, you know, providing us with some hope. And, and I love just, you know, the perspective that you have on things today and, and how you've been able to persevere through everything that you've gone through. So thank you again for coming on and, and for sharing that story with us. Thank you. All right. I hope you have a great rest of your day. You too. Take care. God bless. Thanks for listening to the show today. This has been the Grass Gets Greener podcast, episode 92. Go to thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash Jenny Maher. That's M-A-H-E-R to find the links mentioned during this episode or to leave a comment. And I would love to know what was the takeaway for you from this episode You know, I think with Jenny's story, being able to appeal to a diverse group of people because of the different things that she experienced, that there's a lot of things that could be taken away from it. And so I would love to know what part of Jenny's story resonated with you and, you know, what were you able to take away from that? And so, you know, leave us a comment over on the show notes page, or you can send me an email, melissa at thegrassgetsgreener.com. And I would love to hear that from you. And I'll kind of share what was the biggest takeaway for me, and that is to not take things for granted so much. You know, I've actually been going through a struggle myself recently, and I'm going to be doing a a solo episode in a couple weeks talking about it, actually, because I think it's relevant. And also, you know, I want to be completely transparent. You know, I'm not trying to keep any secrets here. That's certainly not my intention. And as I've been going through this struggle, I realized that there are things that I'm probably taking for granted. And sometimes it really helps to just kind of take a step back and get some perspective and realize that, you know, even though maybe you're not feeling good or things are not going quite the way you want them to, that in spite of that, you know, there's probably some things in your life that are still good, you know, and are still going well. And it's important to look at those things and just to to get that perspective, you know, and I know that that's not always easy to do. And, you know, especially when you're going through some sort of struggle, but if you can find a way to do it, you know, I, I think it can definitely help. And um, after having this call with Jenny, I was able to shift my perspective in that way. And it did help me to some extent. And 
I'm going to, you know, try to be mindful going forward to look at what is going well, what is good, and focus on that and not take those things for granted because I know that ultimately that's going to help me feel better. So if you feel like sharing, you know, any takeaway that you've had, like I said, I'd love to hear it um, either on the show notes page or send me an email, whatever you're most comfortable with. And come back next week as I'm going to be joined by Mark Hoberman, author of Search and Seizure, Overcoming Illness and Adversity. And while we're going to be talking about overcoming illness and adversity and how Mark was able to not let what he was going through define him, but rather to find a way to define it for himself and to take back that control. So a really inspiring story. I hope that you'll come back and join us for it. And like I said, in two weeks, I'm going to be doing a solo episode. So I hope that you'll check that out as well. And just as a reminder, if you're interested in that deal from Audible, that's over at thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash Audible, where you can get the free audio download along with the 30-day free trial. And also don't forget to head over to iTunes or Stitcher to leave the show a rating and review so that we can reach as many survivors as possible. And as always, have hope. Have hope.